<laughs> Welcome to the Internet Caucus RFID Tech Exhibition and Policy Primer. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to introduce um, this morning, just talk about the program that we have for you today. Um, this is an unusual format for us. We have starting off a policy panel, and I'll introduce our esteemed moderator in just one moment. Um, from 9 to roughly 10.30, it's actually 9.15 to roughly 10.30, we'll do a policy portion outline some of the key policy issues that are associated with this issue. And then from roughly 10.30 to 1 o'clock when we have to close down this room, uh, we're going to leave these tech exhibits, um, of which there's close to 50 of them, um, available for congressional staff and others to, to visit and learn more about the different uh, technologies uh, for RFID across a variety of different sectors. But before I uh, bore you any further, let me just uh, introduce uh, our esteemed moderator, Elliot Maxwell, who advises the private sector clients on uh, business technology and public policy and e-commerce issues. He's a fellow at uh, John Hop Hopkins University, a distinguished research fellow at Pennsylvania State University, and as a point of disclosure, he also advises EPC Global, the ent en entity implementing electronic product code version of radio frequency identification. Um, Elliot, welcome. Thanks very much. I'd like to try to make this short and turn immediately to Senator Burns, uh, one of the most important figures in telecommunications. I came out of the telecommunications side, and there's nobody in town who knows more about or has been more important to the development of telecommunications and Internet-related activities than Senator Burns, so let me turn it to him. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Did you folks ever go to bed? Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, um, and, uh, and welcome. Um, I'm Senator Leahy, who just uh, arrived here, and I, I just told him, I said, you know, this is probably the most active caucus there is in the, in the Congress today. Uh, and, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, because uh, we, we're playing with, uh, I think, toys that we all enjoy, and, and also new technologies that are coming down the pike every day to do a multitude of things uh, in our everyday life. And, uh, and the industry, basically, you go out of here, is a pretty quiet industry. And, um, and so th it's made this, this caucus and the interest uh, here in Washington um, uh, uh, very, very high. I, I made a remark the other day that I said it's nice to live in Washington, D.C. You've probably got more brain power, more smart people here than any place I've ever been, but less wisdom. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, Senator Leahy, uh, who is an institutional guy, and he was just telling me a while ago he can't get broadband up in Vermont. And I said, well, Vermont's always been kind of a backward state anyway. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Remember, I speak last. I know. <laughs> you, you'll get your shot, but you got a big target, too. Um, you can't miss. But, uh, but thanks for coming and, and uh, to discuss this policy on RFID. Uh, as you know, in, in, uh, in agriculture, in a lot of ways that we're using uh, all these technologies on our, on our, in our industry right now, just, just to provide a, a very safe food supply for uh, America, and, and, uh, and it's very, very important to us. Um, several groups up here, um, one group in particular is working with the beef, uh, the, the beef uh, network out in Montana. And uh, in other words, bringing some things that, uh, that makes us more efficient and, and uh, also better producers. Uh, Tim Lorden and Charlie Wilson, you've done a great job. Uh, I don't know where they went, uh, but anyway, they've done a great job putting these demos together on, on, of this technology. And, and of course, uh, that's one reason that continues to grow uh, every year. Um, in response to today's RF, uh, ID event, uh, it's, it's been amazing. 50 technology demonstrations are present here today. Oracle, Motorola, Lockheed Martin, uh, just to name a few, but all of them uh, with new ideas. The other day I um, uh, had an opportunity, well it wasn't the other day, it was a couple of years ago, uh, I had uh, a dinner with Bill Gates and uh, he says his only fear uh, and Microsoft, it says some 18-year-old kid is going to walk out of a garage one of these days and blow us out all out of the water. And that's, uh, and what you see around here is a lot of imagination, a lot of ingenuity, uh, and a lot of very, very uh, talented people uh, applying their trade and uh, making things a little bit better. A while ago, I was at the, at the Senate prayer breakfast. We have that every Wednesday morning at, uh, at 8 o'clock and made the announcement and, uh, that this is going on up here. So you might see some more senators come walking through here this morning, but the schedule is pretty tight. 
The frequency identification devices um, is innovative technology which uses small tags that attach to items ranging from passports to pets to wirelessly track and, and identify objects. My wife is interested. Um, she said it'll, it'll, the little tag will fit right there on your lobe, and I said, yeah, sure it will. Um, us old farmers, we, we don't go, we haven't been down that road yet. But, um, the, uh, but what you will see around here today, and I think what you will hear from the panel, is that uh, these, these devices are being used more and more every day for a multitude of, uh, of reasons and, and purposes. Uh, it's, um, it's particularly enhancing our security ability to, to, uh, uh, to secure and to identify uh, bad and good. And of course that adds to our country with the situation we find ourselves today. Uh, it, uh, it, has a, it will have a tremendous role to play. But we've got some challenges, as you well know. And, that, and of course, uh, there wasn't very long ago that we passed E911 or 911. And I can remember just, just because we wanted locator uh, capabilities and technology on cell phones. Whenever you dial your cell phone on 911, well, they, can, they know where you are, just like if you had dialed 911 on a wired line. And, um, and so <laughs> I thought, now this is really a good piece of public safety policy. And uh, it only took four years to pass. <laughs> I don't know if it had really been controversial if we could have got it done. But, you know, you always have these things that come out of the woodwork, and, and, and rightly so, because there are, uh, there are uh, uh, when you come in and, and there are an argument on privacy, such as privacy, and, uh, and, and, this, and this thing here, when do you invade, uh, it calls into question many of the old assumptions and practices of existing regulation and law, and as a result, it will force those of us who make public policy in the technology area uh, to sort out those pluses and those minuses. Um, nevertheless, these two neck top, these two, these, these new technologies will be a part of our lives in some way or other, uh, and used every day. Well, there, and, and so we want to make sure that our policy number one is, is technology neutral, uh, and it's also innovative and it doesn't, and it doesn't, uh, invade on, on what us Americans really, uh, really, uh, care a lot about, and that's, that's our privacy. So we plan to, uh, follow this area very closely in the 109th Congress if necessary, introduce legislation to make sure the right balance between efficiency and privacy is maintained as RFID devices become more and more widespread. Again, I want to thank you for attending this morning. Thank you very much. We've got a kind of a busy schedule. I'm going to hop out of here and I'm going to turn, uh, Senator Leahy loose, unchecked unmonitored so that he can rebut and he's very good at that by the way and uh, but nonetheless I, I also want to um, uh, uh, compliment Senator Leahy he's been a great partner as we started this caucus many years ago and, uh, and had the foresight uh, to see that technologies were changing every day and they were becoming our our way of life and we were dealing trying to deal with new technologies with an old old laws and that wasn't working, and so he's been a great ally, and uh, and brings up those issues that we should that should be debated and thought about as we move uh, this nation forward and take advantage of these new technologies. So he's been a tremendous partner. Uh, we've co-chaired this, this caucus, and and of course uh, uh, put a lot of energy in it. And I don't know of a I don't know of a caucus event that we've had that he hasn't been there. So. Uh, today, if you'll just uh, welcome with me uh, the co-chair of the Internet Caucus and, and good friend, uh, Senator Pat Leahy from Vermont. And thank you again uh, for coming. It's all yours. Thanks, Conrad. You learn how to read, you know, you become you know, a I, <laughs> I was trying to dress like one. The, uh, I'm glad to hear that Conrad was at the uh, prayer breakfast this morning. If there's anybody in the Senate who needs it. <laughs> we pray for you. <laughs> Not enough. Hey, uh, I, uh, and I do like the idea of Mrs. Burns putting the um, tag on. You said your ear, didn't you, Conrad? <laughs> we actually do have internet in, in Vermont. Uh, actually, we're one of the highest users on a per capita basis in the, um, in the country. It's just that <coughs> due to the unholy um, monopolies of the cable companies and the telephone companies, my little community 
while every community around us has cable and the access to high-speed line, we don't. Um, it makes me very happy, as you can tell. <laughs> I do have it where I live here in the Washington area. Actually, I, uh, in some ways, my wife probably thinks that's a good thing. I spend less time on the computer. I, I have to think about that, though. You know, when we started this Internet caucus, one of the reasons we did it, as some of you have heard me say before, is that we want to go around and educate other senators that, who thought that this was an unused TV set in their office when everybody got a, uh, got a computer and to realize that there are ways of, of keeping in touch. In my case, it helps a great deal because I can keep up with my office and uh, I can email photographs of my grandchildren. Let me just show you. Uh, and, and so on. The RFID, the Radio Frequency Identification Technology, is one I'm, I've been looking at very carefully. It's not, it's not a new technology, but it's come, uh, come of age. I gave a speech at Georgetown Law School, my alma mater, last year on it, and uh, talking about some of the questions that we have to raise. In this, in this case, I was talking about the privacy issues that are, are going to be obvious in that. Um, but it's even since then, it's undergone a lot of self-discovery. Its uses are more widely known by consumers. Uh, companies have had a chance to evaluate its benefits and costs. There's a great deal of it. You know, we could talk about the history of physical objects. That could benefit every commercial sector, whether you're, you're shipping goods around the country, around the world, doing inventory control or everything else. Uh, we do use it in animal tracking. We're, uh, we're talking about it, whether in our state or others, where our state's a dairy state and most of our agriculture and the animal tracking, but health care, pharmaceutical delivery, and, of course, the issues of security are immense. Um, in the government, many, tech, uh, many departments are talking about it, uh, ranging from, again, the mundane tracking of supplies to more sophisticated applications like biometric passports, federal employee ID cards. Uh, so it's going to be a significant technology. I don't think anybody here, even those who are working the most on it, can predict where it's going to be five or ten years from now. But if it's like all these technologies, it's going to be greatly expanded from where it is today. Our job is to make sure that we master the technology not let the technology master us. The privacy and questions are real ones. And I want everybody to know that there is a growing concern in this country. This is not a Democratic or Republican concern or liberal or conservative. It's a concern of many, many people about the question of privacy and the security of our data. Uh, I've been in the Senate for 30 years. I've actually, I think, framed and kept only about one or two articles ever written about me. The one I did keep was a sidebar of a story that was in the New York Times. They, they did a profile of me, but they did a small sidebar. And, and to put this in perspective, I live on a, on a dirt road, a little town in Middlesex. It's a, an old tree farm with magnificent views, some of the best views in Vermont. And there's a neighboring farm uh, to us where they've looked over the place. They've hated our fields and done this since I was a teenager. And the story goes like this. It's a Saturday morning. <coughs> the New York Times reporter in an out-of-state car is driving up the road looking for Senator Leahy's home. Stops and asks an old farmer on the porch, does Senator Leahy live up this road? The farmer said, you a relative of his? And he said, no. He said, you a relative of his? He, he said, uh, are, are you a friend of his? He said, uh, no, not really. He said, he expecting you? I said, no. Farmer looks him right in the eye and said, never heard of him. <laughs> uh, we like our privacy. But then when you look at what's happened with the absolute irresponsible actions of Choice Point and Bank of America in losing the data, 
the uh, data of their customers and what that's going to, the problems that's going to create. We see even a unit of LexisNexis, something that every one of us use. That reminds us that there, you have to be far more concerned about data security in a technological age. Now, RFID provides this way to collect and distribute and track information, but with its tiny size and its back-end databases, it has its own unique challenges. And I think we have to be proactively vigilant protecting privacy and security. I mean, I want RFID to work because I can see all the different things that can, can be done with it. But I want to protect the privacy and security of our people. And I think that companies and government and government has to be forthright about how they plan to use this technology and how that information will be secured. And technological protections are critical. Those of us who are both privacy and technology advocates were concerned recently to learn about the lack of encryption capabilities in biometric U.S. passports. Now, that's negligence on the part of our State Department and the part of our government in not doing that because it's in these passports sensitive information will be kept. Uh, and it goes beyond negligence. I think it's arrogance uh, to assume that it's not necessary to do that. And just yesterday, the FTC issued a staff report echoing these principles. And I'd urge the industry to look carefully at these guidances because RFID is an important technology. But the challenges for data security and privacy are real. I want developers and users to be proactive and vigilant because you also want to encourage consumer comfort and acceptance. And that's why I'm glad so many companies are here. Uh, you are developing some tremendous things. But keep in mind the backlash after Choice Point and Bank of America. Uh, don't, don't go so blithely into this that you haven't thought about privacy and security because the backlash could seriously damage what I think is an exciting new technology. This is something we all work together and um, I appreciate you coming here. I agree with Senator Burns and, and he and I are uh, he and I are very close friends and we we have tried very hard to make sure that this caucus is a nonpartisan one. It goes beyond being bipartisan. It's nonpartisan. We're all in this together. And so I applaud you for doing it. I thank you for letting me speak. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'll speak from here. I'm, I'm going to try just to briefly introduce the panelists and then talk for a couple minutes about RFID in general. Uh, in your programs, the, the panelists are identified and, and on the website uh, there's a great deal of biographical information, but the panelists will be Paula Bruning, who is staff counsel, Center for Democracy and Technology, Dan Caprio, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Technology Policy and the Chief Privacy Officer of the Department of Commerce, Alan Estevez, Assistant Deputy Secret Undersecretary of Defense for Supply Chain Integration at the Department of Defense, and Sandy Hughes, Global Privacy Executive of Procter & Gamble and co-chair of the EPC Global Public Policy Working Group. When one talks about RFID, I, I, I was told I had about eight minutes, and so to, to give you RFID 101, but this is an audience that for by the most part doesn't need very much introduction to it. Um, I thought I'd just probably read the entire our 54 page report by the FTC to give you some background that was issued yesterday. It can be found online at www.ftc.gov. Um, let me just talk a little bit about it and about some of the, the issues that are uh, implicated by RFID. It's an old technology. It started in World War II to identify friend or foe by airplanes, and now you have it every day. You have it in building access systems. You have it on easy pass to get on the, in the highways quicker. You have it uh, on the fare, the fare cards in the metro. Uh, you have it in the mobile speed pass. So it's around you. And what's, what's different about it now is the fact that, like everything else in IT, it's become cheaper, smaller, more capable, and it's going to get yet cheaper and smaller and more capable still. And the 
interesting part of it is because it's gotten that way, it has the opportunity to be attached to every object and to make every object able to communicate. And that's an extraordinary thing. We've never had that. A world in which every object can talk in some way. And what, like every other infrastructural technology, it does is to allow people to imagine new uses every single day. We will never be able to predict how it's going to be used. But we're able to see in general that certain kinds of issues will continue to emerge, whatever the form and whatever the application. But it is infrastructural in the same way the internet was inter infrastructural. That you couldn't predict, but you have to think about what it means. In thinking about RFID, you have to sort of think about it systemically. There are just a batch of parts that all interact and all have trade-offs. You have the tags themselves. Sometimes people call them chips, some people, sometimes people call them transponders. Little bits of silicon for the most part with an antenna, uh, an integrated circuit, and depending upon the kind of chip, more or less memory, maybe a power source to make it an active chip as opposed to a passive chip, uh, larger or smaller antenna which tells you about how far the, the chip can communicate or whether it can initiate communications uh, on its own, and some identifier that's on the chip itself. And so the insight that people had about these chips was that the smaller they became, the cheaper they were. And so instead of talking about $40 chips or $2 chips, you're now talking about 10 cent chips and eventually you're going to talk about chips that are less than a penny. And you'll be talking about chips that are, go, that are printed on as opposed to attached in some other way. So everything is driving these things into be cheaper, smaller, more, more uh, competent to do more and more things. A second piece of this are the readers. The readers, in the case of those chips that don't have a power source, emit radio frequency energy, power up the chip, receive the uh, information, the identifier on the chip, and pass that information on over a network to a database. So these readers can be mobile, they can be fixed, they are radiating energy and picking up the identifier for the, uh, from the chip. So you've got the chip or the transponder, you've got the reader, you've got a network to get the information back to a database, and really critically for all of this is the database itself. Because in the case of the cheapest, dumbest, smallest chips, they'll have a little identifier on it that's unique to the item, but that identifier is going to mean relatively little. It'll have the information that you might have on a barcode today. But the secret of why this becomes more and more powerful is the database to which it's connected. Because that database can take that little identifier and say, it's got, it was made here, it came out of this batch, it has this chemical composition, it should be recycled in this way, it has toxic characteristics, it has, was shipped here, sold here, anything you want to put in. And it's now limited only by the economics of information input. So that database is the critical piece. It can't obviously operate without the hardware and software, but that's what makes this really uh, almost limitless in its potential. So the four pieces of this then say uh, need to be looked at because there are trade-offs. Chips that are active and have their own power source are more expensive. Chips with bigger antennas can communicate further. Uh, chips that are smaller or cheaper and may be easier to use in mass quantity. And here we're talking not about billions of objects. We're potentially talking eventually about trillions of objects that have this attached to them. Every object can communicate. And these objects can be linked with sensors for heat, for air pressure, for uh, oh, time intervals. Again, all of these things kind of get a richer and richer set of data stored in these databases connected to these chips. Now, how they're being used? They're being used, again, just think of all of the collective intelligence that goes into the possibility of using these chips. In the ph pharmaceutical industry, we're seeing this used to make sure that drugs aren't counterfeit, that you can check the pedigree of the pharmaceutical as it moves through the supply chain. For retailers, it means identifying things from factory all the way to store shelf. 
right now focused on the supply chain to make sure the right things are in the supply chain, to reduce the inventory, to reduce added products that people have to keep moving through the inventory to get things to the stores, to reduce shrinkage because you can track what's in, in the store and out of the store, to uh, facilitate returns or warranties, to, uh, to do recalls, in, as Senator Burns said, in the food safety chain, to make sure that you know where the food came from, how it was treated, when it got there, to deal with expiration dates. Uh, people who have uh, pets will have their pets chipped so that if a pet is lost or if goods are stolen, you'd be able to identify it. But some of these applications depend on chips being active over a long period of time. Some of these don't depend on that at all, and one can imagine turning the chips off or deactivating or removing them from a product. But the uses are as many uses as people can imagine. Uh, they are anti-counterfeiting. They are, people are thinking about uh, tracking for uh, livestock. In a hospital, one starts to look at uh, multiple machines that you don't want to buy more than you need, but you need to know where they are in the hospital. So the healthcare industry is likely to be a very early adopter, and the Defense Department is an early adopter for a whole different range of reasons. So it looks like a technology that will be part of our everyday lives. It looks like a technology that will become more and more present. And there are a, a number of issues that are raised by it. The first that both Senator uh, Burns and Senator Leahy raised are the question of privacy. And that is, uh, most acutely, if I can match an object with personally identifiable information about someone, it facilitates a whole series of things that may have positive benefits for a consumer, recalls, warranties, returns, uh, home libraries, home systems. But it also means that possibly people will be profiled about what they bought. And some pe people are concerned about that. People might be tracked on the basis of where they move around in stores. People are concerned about that. People might be concerned about unauthorized readers having access to this information. So there's a set of privacy concerns that are raised uh, about uh, this information that look very much like the kinds of concerns that were raised about loyalty cards and the like. But it is this matching of identify, identifying inf information about you, about an individual, with the purchases or with the use of services or goods. A second and clearly related issue is that of security. Are the databases going to be secure? Uh, these are radio communications, so they're subject to intercept. The chips, are they going to be spoofed? Are we going to know who is authorized to have access to this information? Now, in this case, uh, because lots of people will be sharing the information in the supply chain, there's some real interest on the part of companies to protect the information because they don't want their competitors to have access. But it also means it heightens the risks of the security of the databases and the security of the networks over which the information is transmitted. A third issue, which is sort of a governmental issue, has been that of spectrum. Because these are radio devices, they depend on having access to the radio frequency spectrum. So one question, is there enough, is there enough spectrum available for this? Again, thinking about this not in the context of millions of chips or billions of chips, but trillions of chips and trillions of interactions over the radio. Is the frequency that's available going to be consistent across the world? Because people who are thinking about this in terms of supply chain are thinking about being able to use it in Europe, in Asia, in North America, South America. So they need to be able to use the systems to get the most out of it in comparable spectrum bands to make it less expensive to use. Uh, there are issues about more and more radio frequency exposure because now you're going to have more and more devices making use of radio waves and those issues will come up as they came up with, with regard to cell phones. Um, so the health issues are ones where both the FCC and other bodies are making sure that the standards exist for radio emissions, but there, we now will continue to have more and more emitters in our uh, factories, in our uh, homes, and so people are going to be concerned about that potentially. Issues uh, about the environment on one side, will, these, will the fact that you have chips on these devices make it harder to recycle, on the other side, if I have this chip and it can identify what the chemical composition of a particular product is, maybe I can in fact dramatically change the cost and ease of recycling. 
If a chip on a plastic bottle tells the sorter in a recycling plant where and how to recycle this plastic, maybe, in fact, I make recycling much easier than I did before. Or if I can identify that this object has toxic material and how it's treated, I may change the way I think about recycling and conservation. And last, there are going to be effects in terms of employment. Lots of things that happen with regard to these chips are efficiency enhancers for supply chain management and the like. You now can count things automatically instead of trying to read barcodes because the advantage of RFID is you can do things, you can do a number of items at the same time and you don't have to be looking at the item, not have to be line of sight. But that means that jobs which simply involve counting, we took in this many, we shipped this many, uh, will be rendered redundant. Uh, people can do other work, but this efficiency gain is going to have an impact on labor as well. And that's another issue that people need to be thinking about in terms of these efficiency gains. Reduced costs makes more likely that things are on the shelf, but there are other sides of this as well. So that's a, a little overview of, of some of the issues about the technology. I think everybody on this panel is excited about the positive impacts of it and the fact that it liberates people to think of new ways of using it and all of the people on the panel are also concerned to make sure that we think about it up front in terms of these issues, that we think about what we can do about them in terms of educating our consumers, educating our policymakers, understanding uh, what kinds of things the technology can do to deal with these issues, understanding what industry can do to work to make sure that we get the most positive benefits and reduce the likelihood that we have neg negative impacts. So with that, let me turn it over to Sandy Hughes of Procter & Gamble and the EPC Global Public Policy Working Group, and have her go. Thank you, Elliot. This is on. Okay, that's great. Alan, I'm going to move it over just a little bit. Great. Um, as Elliot mentioned to you, I am the uh, I head up the Global Privacy Program at Procter and Gamble. And just as a primer for you, Procter and Gamble sells over 350 brands in over 180 countries, and we have about 110,000 people. Last year, we sold over 50 billion dollars across the world. Our global privacy program is really based on the objective to earn the trust of anyone from whom we collect personal information, regardless of the technology, the medium, or the geography. And with this personal information, we're better able to provide the products and services and information that individuals want and need. RFID is included in our global privacy program as well. And even though our current strategy is to optimize the supply chain, that means pallets and cases, we have no plans for item level tagging at this point. Nevertheless, we feel the future of this technology is paramount to the success and the benefit for consumers in the future. So uh, for this reason, we also recognize that for cons in order for consumers to accept RFID, they must understand the benefits for them and be confident that their privacy will be protected. So we feel, even though we don't have it in our plans for item level tagging, we feel we need to address this early on. And for that reason, we play a lead role in the EPC Global Public Policy Steering Committee. Uh, EPC Global, for your information, is the standards making body that has as a parent UCC EAN, which is now GC1, or the founders of the barcode. So if you think about EPC Global scope, it would be to make electronic barcodes. Wherever you see a barcode today, that that would become electronic. And therefore, the difference is um, you don't need line of sight for that. We have a lot of efficiencies that we can get in the supply chain. So think about that as the scope. Where you see a barcode, it would be EPC or electronic product code. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Board, who's the executive director for the Public Policy Steering Committee, couldn't be here today. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing as a group. Our steering committee is made up of representatives from the total EPC Global member body of manufacturers, retailers, and trade associations. We have a maximum of 25 in our charter so that we keep it at a, at a, uh, at a real working membership. We have a number of subcommittees, though, where we have others of the membership who participate on those. Mine is the working group, where, um, which I co-chair with the retailers, and our first piece of business was to review and come to consensus on the usage guidelines for implementing EPC in the consumer product goods supply chain. 
In addition, we came up with Q&A for new members who join the network so that they know what their responsibilities are for providing notice, choice, security, et cetera, as they implement EPC within their, their businesses. These are just the starting point, and as the technology continues to develop, we find additional issues to address. We'll continue to modify these guidelines as we go on. Follow-on work from this is to define the technical requirements to offer more choices to consumers to protect their privacy, security, etc. In addition, we have another committee that's defining the accountability process for implementing the guidelines. We have regional subgroups that look at specific issues and outreach uh, within the U.S., also in Europe, and we have plans for Asia and Latin America for the future. The communications and education subgroup is responsible for creating educational materials and websites that all of the regional groups can use and customize for their geographies. Privacy is just one of the public policy issues we plan to address. Next on the agenda is environment, health and safety, and any other public issues that come up we would plan to address as a steering committee. I'll be happy to answer any of the questions you have about P&G, our test and learn program, as well as EPC Global. We have Jack Grasso and uh, Jennifer Terso back there to also answer questions for EPC Global. So I hope to see you later. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Elliot. Um, start off, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Department of Defense, we're $430 billion a year, not-for-profit, uh, <laughs> focused on, yeah, a little big, uh, deterring and, should that fail, defeating the enemies of the United States, protecting our freedoms. Uh, in order to do that, from the logistics standpoint, uh, on a fairly complex supply chain, $70 billion plus worth of inventory. Uh, process about 30 million requisitions every year to supply our forces in the field, uh, manage about 5 million uh, what you would call SKUs. Uh, so fairly complex. So in due respect to uh, Senator Leahy, there's nothing mundane about <laughs> managing that supply chain. And we frankly view uh, RFID as one of the key capabilities out there that was, that's going to help us do that. Um, we're going about this uh, for the same reason that Walmart is, frankly, uh, my, my uh, partner's down in Bentonville. Uh, Walmart's interested in making sure that Procter & Gamble products are on their shelf so that when you walk in as a consumer, you're able to buy it. Well, I'm interested in making sure that uh, when that soldier, sailor, airman, and marine that we've put out in harm's way turns for a repair part, for a piece of body armor, for a, uh, a bullet, it's there. It's there, and that's the key, key factor for us. So we believe RFID is one of the uh, key capabilities that we're going to use to do that. Frankly, we've been using RFID in the department uh, extensively for about the last 12 years, uh, using active RFID. We probably run the largest active RFID network in the world today. Uh, we have about a $300 million investment in that, and what we're using is active tags to track C-vans, uh, think about a truck. Uh, load of, of cargo or a large air pallet, which is the equivalent, frankly, of a C van in our air system, uh, tracking down to the item level of what's moving in that supply chain. Uh, we've also moved out, you know, we issued a policy last uh, July uh, that A articulated that we're going to continue using that active technology and, in fact, embrace it as a standard way of doing business. That impacts shipments from the Department of Defense to the Department of Defense. I maintain about 26 uh, depots around the world. Uh, obviously, we have global reach, so we have forces all over the place. Um, the second facet of that policy is that we're embracing uh, passive RFID incoming to us from our vendors uh, at the case pallet level. Again, the same as uh, what Procter & Gamble is doing, uh, shipping to Walmart. Um, that is a fairly massive enterprise for us. I have upwards of 46,000 uh, suppliers. Many of those are small businesses. Uh, in order to uh, make sure that they're capable of doing that, we have an extensive outreach program. Uh, we've been working through many of the industry associations that uh, represent those suppliers. Uh, we've engaged the Procurement Technical Assistance Center to do outreach and training to small businesses so that they are able to stand up and comply with our policy. We're working through a rulemaking process now with uh, the, federal, the federal government rulemaking process, which uh, moves through office management and budget 
to put out a standard contract clause that will make it mandatory for folks to start tagging at the case pallet level. And we have a phased in approach starting with our two major uh, supply depots, rolling out to all our supply depots in the 2006 time frame and then to everywhere in the Department of Defense in 2007. Also staggers by the type of supply that you uh, focus on. Uh, our main focus initially is on repair parts. Again, to us, uh, having a multi-hundred million dollar asset plane sitting on the ground, that's a lot of money for the American taxpayer, and it also is a readiness impact on the forces that we put in harm's way, which is more important to us, quite frankly. Uh, but I don't want to, uh, to disparage the taxpayer aspect of that, because making that dollar work for us is just as important. So uh, having those things tagged is critical to us to be able to track those, those items. Uh, while we are working through that rulemaking process, we do have volunteers that are tagging items and shipping them to those depots today. Lockheed Martin was the first, and uh, there are a number of other companies that are engaged in that volunteer process. For them, it helps them hone their processes because they're embracing this technology as well. A company like Lockheed Martin or Boeing has massive supply chain behind it as well. So they're looking at how do you turn RFID to their own benefit, just the same way Procter & Gamble is in the consumer products area. Uh, concurrently with our, our rollout to our vendors, in other words, people shipping to the Department of Defense, I do have this massive internal Department of Defense to Department of Defense supply chain where I ship out, you know, fill those 30 million requisitions. And we are also tagging outbound from Department of Defense depots to we started off small. We have a couple of uh, points out in the, uh, our supply chain, a couple of destinations uh, where we are tagging outbound and we're using that uh, RFID as, in, in our best case, our uh, cross-dock facility out at Norfolk is using it as a cannibal transaction uh, in their business process. They are stuffing sea vans that are going outbound, uh, mostly focused on the European theater, a little bit to the Middle East. Uh, and they're, the RFID tag it's a passive EPC RFID tag is being used as the accountable transaction of what is going in those C-Vans. Um, we are also uh, focused at a tactical unit down at Camp Lejeune. Eventually what I want to do is get to the point where I can do accountable receipt transactions using RFID. Today, as you can imagine, barcodes is, is the standard that's used for that. Well, this should come as no surprise to anyone who's ever been in the military, but if you're working at night, which is what you tend to do in the uh, environment, in a combat environment. Uh, first of all, that little red light for the barcode scanner is not a good thing because you can see that if you're in a desert environment, for instance, the enemy can see it and can see where you are. But there's other things coming, going on, like incoming mortar fire. Uh, soldiers tend not to focus on doing that accountable cannibal receipt transaction in those conditions. Well, the problem with that is, then I don't know that the material that we shipped got to them. And sometimes they don't even know that they have it because it's sitting there, but they haven't done a receipt, so it's not in their books. And unless they saw it, they don't issue it. So you know what they do then? They order another one. If they order another one, I get this downward ripple spiral of, of course, now I have to have another one in inventory. That's a cost to the taxpayer. Their readiness has uh, been detrimented because they had, don't have the part that they needed to do their mission. Plus, I'm putting it on lift. Lift being a plane, a ship, et cetera. Well, you know, in the commercial sector, uh, lift tends to be uh, homogenous. It's out there. There's lots of lift capability. In a place like Iraq, you know, the FedEx flights don't flow at a normal uh, schedule pace like they do to most other sectors of the world. Uh, if it doesn't say USAF on the tail, you're probably not going to get it. Well, I only have so many planes, and they have to do this kind of downward spiral when they do a place when they land in a place like Blot Air Base. Um, so, if I'm putting the same part that I already have on that site on that plane, that means I'm not putting something else that's just as important on that plane, and that lift capacity is lost. RFID can help us do that because it can do an automatic in check of what is on the ground at a particular point. Uh, the Marines in Iraq are already moving forward to try to implement uh, technology using uh, passive EPC RFID to track material forward on that battlefield. Uh, and we're encouraging that. Uh, last point I want to make is that uh, 
we are members of EPC. Um, I actually sit on the board of uh, EPC Global. Um, and we are working very closely with them to drive the standards and to drive the processes that uh, uh, we believe will uh, help not just our supply chain, but uh, supply chains across the universe as uh, we move forward. Thanks. Dan Caprio of the Department of Commerce. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Tim Morton and the Internet Caucus. That's your button. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tim Morton and the Internet Caucus. Not on. There it is. Start over. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. I uh, wanted to, uh, to thank Tim Lorden, here he goes, and the Internet Caucus for uh, hosting today's event. Um, RFID, as you've heard, uh, is viewed as an emerging technology with the potential really to disrupt and, and transform uh, currently used systems for cataloging operations, manufacturing, retail, service sectors of the economy. Uh, at the Department of Commerce, uh, we formed a, uh, an RFID working group uh, involving all of our, our different bureaus from the Technology Administration, where, where I am, uh, where it's really our job to maximize technology's contribution to the economy, uh, to NTIA, uh, dealing with Spectrum and Wireless, uh, Patent and Trademark Office on, on patent issues, NIST on, on standards, uh, ITA on international issues and, and ESA on uh, productivity issues. We formed a working group to, to begin to examine the whole set of issues from the department's perspective and, and we're going to be holding a workshop on April 6th uh, entitled RFID in 2005 uh, Technology and Industry Perspectives. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you more about that later. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, policy issues related to RFID. Uh, obviously, I mean, and you've heard from Senator Burns and Senator Leahy and others, that uh, RFID promises to deliver many benefits in key sectors of business, consumer and government services. However, uh, as is common with emerging technologies, deploying RFID presents challenges that must be surmounted in order for the technology to mature and realize its full potential. Uh, these include, but are not, not limited to, and Elliot's mentioned some of these, uh, interoperabil interoperability standards for tags and readers, uh, continuing technology development, uh, common technical and transmission standards, wireless spectrum operations, privacy and security concerns, which I'll mention in a second, and, and cost barriers for, for small and medium enterprises. Um, the applications of RFID uh, stem in part uh, from the uh, plethora of applications envisioned by technology developers and users, applications such as enhanced tracking in the supply chain, uh, integration of inventory and logistics, automated monitoring of product availability and quality, uh, control of critical infrastructure facilities, and security applications really are propelling the RFID market. Uh, while the efficiency enhancing potential of RFID is high, there's, there are differing time frames associated with the deployment of RFID. In, in general, and you've heard this from, from uh, Sandy and, and Alan, in general, current RFID tagging uh, is at the container, case, or pallet level for inventory and shipping applications. Um, according to experts, uh, consumers will, won't see item level tagging for another five to ten years. Um, we've heard from Senator Burns and Senator Leahy this morning about privacy and security. Uh, a key public policy challenge in the use and deployment of RFID relates to privacy and security and that's you know the privacy and security of, of personally identifiable information. Most privacy and security concerns about RFID involve the use of RFID at the individual customer, le customer level at or after the point of sale rather than in the supply or inventory tracking applications. For example, uh, some privacy advocates concern revolve around whether and what type of notice uh, is a, the notice is important. What type of notice is given to customers when RFID is used? Whether options are provided to customers to disable the tag? What data is collected and how it's used or shared? And how long and for what purpose the data is retained? 
data collected by RFID systems pose similar questions as data collected from credit card use and barcode scanning. Um, many in the privacy community have expressed uh, concerns regarding the data collected through RFID use. Most of the concerns are directed at the data collection rather than the technology. The collection concerns include the type of data being collected, the use of the data, the mining of the data, user profiles, and the sharing of the data with other groups. Uh, the concerns really evolve around that. Another concern is that, that RFID tags uh, can remain active after purchase and that third party uh, groups might, you know, might be able to access that tag information or track item movements. Uh, another, another concern is whether the consumer purchasing an item with a tag is informed of that. That's back to, to notice. Um, there are many possible uh, privacy solutions. The, we've seen some, some surveys that the general population is becoming more familiar with RFID and with privacy and security issues. Uh, you, you heard this morning the you know, we've, we've all heard a lot about Choice Point and, and B of A, and I think the, the, uh, the potential for backlash there is very real. But uh, studies in 2004 showed an increasing awareness among consumers about RFID technology and its uses. A uh, September 2004 survey showed that 72% uh, of respondents had never heard of RFID, and that uh, of the 28% that had, most had learned about RFID from the Internet. Uh, versus traditional mass media. Uh, to address some of these privacy concerns, uh, many companies are working on finding ways to resolve privacy issues. These solutions, many of which are still in development, take the form of industry self-regulation, technical solutions, and consumer education. Uh, one generally accepted principle of information privacy is concerned with the disclosure of how information is collected and stored and how it will be used and protected. Uh, there must be, and I emphasize this, there must be market-based that provide notice and consumer choice in the, in the information use or data sharing. Technology solutions range, range from completely disabling tags at the point of sale with magnetic or electrical energy uh, to rewriting tags with meaningless information. Uh, mentioned uh, education. Uh, education and outreach to the consumer, user, and citizen is vital uh, in terms of explaining the technology. The choices and the benefits are just as important as the other solutions being, being proposed. Uh, as part of this information sharing about best practices uh, at the business level regarding data collected, use, and sharing, that education would allow for the emergence, I believe, of a, a industry standard of acceptable uh, and informed procedures around, around notice and, and choice. Uh, of, of, of RFID. Um, our our uh, commerce workshop, and I'd like to welcome all of you to, invite all of you to attend. Uh, it's, as I said, RFID in 2005, uh, Technology and Industry Perspectives, April 6th. It's going to be at, at uh, the department in the main auditorium uh, beginning at 9 o'clock in the morning. The purpose uh, of our workshop really is to, to build on, on some work that's been done in the past by, by NTIA, uh, held a workshop on RFID last year and by the uh, really tremendous work of the Federal Trade Commission uh, in, in the workshop that they, they hosted. So we're, we're trying to build on that. But the, the purpose is, is to supplement, but to really educate policymakers in a forum uh, for the private sector to discuss the latest advances in RFID. Uh, to include the benefits, and we really want to get to the benefits, the technology development, uh, current and future applications, and privacy and security considerations. The introduction of RFID into the marketplace really requires an explanation, I think, of the benefits of the technology and a discussion about actual and perceived challenges. In, in particular, the policy debates both in the U.S. and abroad uh, indicate that much of the concern over RFID uh, is not about the technology, but it's, it is about, as I said, the acceptable use of the, the data. Uh, if ignored, uh, privacy concerns and about the capabilities and use of RFID products could become a significant factor adver adversely affecting the deployment of RFID. 
So the department uh, wants to use the workshop as an opportunity to ensure that the RFID industry concerns and views are heard and that accurate information about the features and abilities of RFID are disseminated. Uh, we're going to run through and do it panel format, but have five different panels, a, a panel uh, on, on hardware, middleware, a supplier panel, uh, a retail panel, and then a, a panel on, uh, on privacy and security. Uh, for more information, uh, you, can, you can certainly see me afterwards, but the, uh, our, our website, the homepage for the Technology Administration, and it's, it's up there, is www.technology.gov. Thank you. Finally, from uh, her uh, appearance on Good Morning America today, Paula Bruning for the Center for Democracy and Technology. Thank you, Elliot, I think. <laughs> Um, yes, when the phone rang at 20 minutes after 7, I knew that they'd used the clip that I did last night. So, um, But I want to thank um, the Internet Caucus and Tim Lorden for hosting this today and for allowing me to be here. And it's always a challenge to be the last person on a policy panel like this because by the time you get to the last person, that person thinks that everything that they had to say has pretty much been said. But I, I will highlight just a few things. Um, that we at the Center for Democracy and Technology have thought to be particularly important in this uh, debate about privacy and security um, in RFID. Um, I'm really glad to be here today because I think it's going to be a great um, opportunity to see these RFID chips in action. Um, CDT is really excited about this technology. We think that it offers a lot of benefits to consumers, to business, to government um, it, for the future. Uh, we think there's going to be great cost savings, uh, a way to be uh, sure that uh, we can authenticate people correctly and um, it can really, uh, there are tremendous benefits to be reaped here and we're very excited uh, to see this all going forward. Um, we are a nonprofit public interest organization um, and we advocate for uh, civil liberties in, the, in digital media, um, but we are friends of technology and that's why we think that it's so important that privacy and security be addressed early uh, as this technology goes forward. Um, I won't belabor some of the comments that have already been made about why RFID uh, does present particular questions about privacy. Um, I think that it's true that it is about data collection and we're living in a time, as we all know, of uh, tremendous uh, a collection of data. I think this is a new way of doing it. It, pr it heightens people's concerns. And it's true, it's not really about technology, but I would say that this particular technology does present some challenges to um, how we uh, make sure that there's trust in the technology. Um, it, it may be obvious, but I think sometimes it's overlooked that one of the reasons that this raises such concerns for people is that they can't see when this technology is being used necessarily, and they don't really engage the collection process. When I go to the store and I purchase something and I use my credit card, I know that certain information is being turned over and being collected. Um, I'm engaged in that process. I have a month that says that that happened. I think FID, because it is because it, the information collection potentially goes on silently, I think it does raise concerns for people that other information collection perhaps don't. Um, I think also the fact that you know there is going to be increased proliferation of readers uh, is also of concern. It's a um, we're creating new infrastructure here for data collection. Infrastructure is great. Uh, they streamline uh, they streamline the collection of information, but they tend to be more, they tend to grow, and I think that also is something that has concerns about privacy. But at the end of the day, what we see is trust. How do we build in privacy so that the technology is forward and can be used in a robust way and consumers can feel comfortable using it? We think the traditional notion of fair information practices, which we've talked about a little bit today already, really are at the core of uh, building in that kind of uh, privacy protection. I think that going back to the two elements of how the, the, the technology is somewhat invisible and the collection is very quiet, I think that really challenges fair information practices a bit. And so while people's uh, technology clearly, it's going to be really, really important to figure out how to 
their information practices in a concrete way to this particular kind of data collection. Part of industry to do that. We at CDT project that's ongoing where we're trying to it is collected uh, using our FID. The risks are that FID raises for people and what the concerns are, and then we're working toward best practices for the of uh, fair information practices. We're involved in advocates into this inquiry uh, that we're hoping to have a project later this year that will be a part of the discussion that some companies may well want to sign on as to move forward on uh, implementing privacy protections. Um, I think it's been raised repeatedly about privacy um, RFID is in the area of use of RFID in libraries and I um, in I think in this country there are norms of free speech and free association free um, and it, what we read is very, very important to our sense, our sense of personal autonomy. And the idea that be tracked or linked with other personal information raises tremendous concern uh, for library patrons and, and book readers, but then I think also to librarians who have certain systems of ethics about how they deal with um, reader and patron lists and what those readers are using in the library. The American Library Association and the book industry um, Working group, has, uh, or excuse me, study group, has come up with their own guidelines for use of RFID in the environment that on enforcement of um, of institutional uh, privacy policies, good security um, policies of not li storing information on RFID tags, uh, security safeguards, and compliance with best practices and laws. Um, finally, I just like comments on security, um, as we heard today, important uh, question uh, the events of the last couple of weeks had made, made clear that security is really key to have good, good privacy if you don't have good security. Security of the databases uh, that are being used is going to be critical. It's also going to be very important um, to look at what happens when we start using RFID is that identifying particular items that's on identification tag and we use them in more of a sense when we use them to authenticate particular uh, to a particular building to a particular to being able to use a particular piece of machinery. Um, when we do that we start moving from the area of um, identification into more of a secure device. Our foster security as we do that I think it's going to be look at the extent to which we've put in the right uh, met the right requirements for security with the right kind of testing. Some of that work is being done at Johns Hopkins and at RSA and I think we closely the attack become um, more powerful, more confident, we're using them in more diverse ways. Um, and I think I'll leave my remarks at that and some discussion later. Thank you. Uh, I think we heard sort of uh, a really good view overview of our 14 questions. I just want to take two last points. One is uh, people who are interested in policy, this is not uh, is undiscovered. The number of uh, pieces of state introduced last year about RFID, likely that there will be more state legislation introduced this year. So public policy domain right now, uh, people with at the, at the municipal level through libraries and other forms, all the way up to the next level, considering the technology. The second is a kind of mutable law about and that is when new technologies emerge and used uh, in new ways, there can be a lot of ignorance about how the technology functions and its impact, and that causes a kind of conversation that may not be based on good information, often is based on bad information, but people say, well, I don't understand this, I don't know what you're I don't want it around. And we've seen this again and again, in, we've seen it a little bit. That implementation of the technology, helping people understand what it does, how it does it, how it's used, what can 
protections are involved, causes more problems to try front. Help to build protections, make them more confident. And so I would just say that this technology and the, what people have said today, we have an opportunity before it becomes even more widely to help educate people, system protections, think through these issues, that it will be true everything in 10 years. This firm base of knowledge and confidence in technology that will allow it to be, to be used in the kinds of ways that people have described this morning, and countless other ways that people with imagination will give money to the technology and not have the kind of that gets in the way. So we have the opportunity up front to think about don't take that opportunity where it falls. And, and this discussion of it and to think through these things together in order to make use of the technology in better ways. So with that, let me questions from the audience. We have had you know, 10 minutes or so questions, and I would welcome them. No question. Yes, it's yes. Um, the applications of our that that I'm applying at the case path level or is not the same reader that's going to talk pass. Standard for specific applications and specific. Uh, but in order for a supply, there are the standard readers that can read a plethora of different tags made by different readers. And that's and there's growth in that sector. One of the things that's true, the flip side of the standards, is because you have to be able to build the supply that all the public and people can build readers uh, that we're not sort of authorized in the sense of not participating with the PNG or with the So that is the issue of the kind of unauthorized reader, which triggers a number of problems. Military side, say so we're being RFID. Uh, again, I've talked about how the passive RFID. British great star active RFID. Uh, passive RFID, all those kinds of uh, what we're doing. Applications for us in Europe and Asia today. Elizabeth, public policy steering committee is not here today it's because there's a group of EC global people who are there trying to coordinate the state nationally. Company nationals in countries. It's really important for us to have the various geographies, uh, which isn't there today. So as we do um, different applications country because that makes just adds additional to our supply chain. Um, sending to uh, make sure that what we put on be read by a reader. Uh, is growing international and and uh, a lot of fast movement that's going on. we're trying to coordinate that through EC Global. Uh, if you again, if you think about number of 
different kinds of applications lead in 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 those areas in where there's where there's an even greater proliferation of people are by the chip and the cell phones themselves the phone uh, financial changes is to to the cell phone so all kinds of devices all kinds of uh, thanks for uh, on on the policy front I mean if we talk more about message and state the policy front there's uh, quite a bit going on in, uh, throughout the uh, the European Union is really the uh, paper concern that RFID might uh, contravene use directive uh, on, on, on Japan has a, a, a privacy guideline ID the, uh, for development of uh, ID privacy guidelines <laughs> within the Pacific economic operation of the uh, the EU with others will in terms of China, and uh, uh, the attention to. You stand to the con tampering device a egg but able to the whether it's been open is a spot that it's a problem through and what kind technology is security and and uh So you've got
in the 